In 1966, Stevie Nicks, 18 years old and a talented singer, began dating guitarist Lindsey Buckingham during their senior year at Menlo Atherton High School in Los Angeles, and one of the most important musical partnerships in rock and roll was born. California was in the midst of the hippie era, and Stevie and Lindsey, together with their band Fritz, started their career during San Francisco's Summer of Love, opening for the iconic acts of the time, including Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and the Jefferson Airplane. Though without a record deal, Fritz remained a fixture on the Californian circuit as the hippies fell away and music moved into the 1970s. By the early 70s, the West Coast sound of California was reverting to uh, the, the melodicism and the harmonies uh, of the mid-60s. They'd gone through the, 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 the psychedelic era. Uh, and so by the early 70s, you know, even bands like The Grateful Dead, famous for 30-minute uh, you know, versions of Dark Star with extended guitar solos, they're doing country-ish uh, tinged albums with tight songs. So uh, I, I, I guess... Pop music has become cool again, and this is this is uh, firing the Californian sound of 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 the early seventies. This was a time when everyone from Bonnie Raitt to Little Feet to Jackson Brown to Joni Mitchell were making truly eclectic music. We're coming out of the sixties. You have artists exploring the connections between blues, country, rock and roll, pop, and that's the space that. Stevie Nicks steps into. Though Fritz had achieved some popularity as a live act in the Bay Area, they had failed to attract the attention of a record industry more interested in singer-songwriters than a post-Summer of Love San Francisco band. When record producer Keith Olsen eventually made the trip from LA to assess the group, he concluded that the potential of Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham was far greater than that of Fritz. The band was pretty good, but Stevie and Lindsey were great. That's what can I say? So I'm, I mentioned it to, you know, after trying to do a demo that I was really interested in working with Stevie and Lindsay and not with the band. And so, you know, how that goes, that goes over really poorly, you know, and that's, you know, a really sad thing to do. And so you feel terrible doing that, but that's reality. Lindsay developed a style and started writing these songs with Stevie and they recorded these demos on his four track and they were stunning. And so they came down, played them for me. And I said, we can get a deal. So um, we ran out, we got a deal and recorded them. You may not be as strong as me. You know, I wanted to get this team of people. You know, uh, record production is really putting together a team, you know, so that Lindsay could be at ease and could just play off mus other musicians because when you have musicians in one room all playing together, magic happens. You know, we had Waddy, Wachtel, uh, we had Ronnie Tutt and Jerry Sheff. Ronnie Tutt, Jerry Sheff, it's basically Elvis's rhythm section. And we had some, just some great players that were all about, that just dove into what Lindsay was playing and said, oh yeah, we can do this. And it was, it was quite fast. No longer part of a band, Stevie found herself in a position where she would have to assert herself as an artist alongside her more versatile partner. While Lindsay was the lead instrumentalist and musical director on the album that would become known simply as Buckingham Nicks, Stevie was credited with half of the songs on the record. 
There's no doubt that Stevie's early partnership with Lindsay Buckingham, both on an artistic and personal level, formed who she was. However, she still, even as a very young woman, had her own set of interests and her own kind of approach to music. So even on Buckingham Nicks, you can hear some of those ballads that are concerned with what it means to be a woman striking out on your own, independence, uh, the tension between love and freedom. All of those themes are there on her very first recorded songs. What, what Stevie Nicks learned from Lindsay Buckingham, I think, is a kind of tunefulness and a, a pop sense. She had her songs that Lindsay really took and, and molded. And sometimes it was really cool. And sometimes Lindsay would think, no, no, we don't want to do that there. The Stevie Nicks songs had that little bit of folky lightness. And uh, Lindsay's uh, material had this deeper uh, sense of feel. A key aspect of Stevie Nicks's early career is that starting with Lindsay Buckingham, she was in harmony with someone on every level, in harmony artistically, personally, but also vocally. Stevie Nicks is a great harmony singer, and learning how to do that in that first partnership with Lindsay Buckingham was so crucial to developing her talent. I think the Buckingham Nicks album is a strong record. The guitar work, there's a real organization to it. It's got a, it's got a, um, it's got a real uh, purpose in its production values as well. The second thing that hits you is how unconfidently they present Stevie Nicks's voice. They, they have a double track all the way through. Now, Stevie Nicks has got a very unusual voice, very textured, a lot of timbre in there. That's a, there's a bit of edge in there. But I get the impression that to, to just put it there unadulterated as a single vocal track was, was, was something they weren't comfortable with, or perhaps Lindsey Buckingham wasn't, wasn't comfortable with. And he had a double track all the way through, which makes it a little gentler on the ear and a little, a little easier as a listen. But it somehow dilutes the, the uniqueness of her, of her timbre. Bits of it are like the Carpenters, but given a bit of rock heft. Uh, so it's very melodic, um, very mellifluous. Uh, and, and really, it is a template for what they're going to do with Fleetwood Mac. And you can, you can listen to that record, and I think you can appreciate what Mick Fleetwood heard that he thought could then be imported profitably into Fleetwood Mac. In spite of all the promise, Buckingham Nicks flopped badly. With their finances stretched, Lindsay and Stevie moved in with Keith Olsen, and Stevie took a waitressing job while Buckingham worked on material for a potential follow-up album. But with no sign that sales would improve, Buckingham Nicks were eventually dropped by Polydor Records. When we did the deal for Buckingham Nicks, uh, you know, the amount of cash we got was enough to pay for studio, some overdubs, a few extra players, and I think we had $5,000 a piece. And so each one of us got $5,000, period. And, uh, and we're try everybody's trying to stretch that. And so, yeah, you can stretch that as far as you can, but it doesn't go very far. There's something about Buckingham Nicks that feels a little minor in a way, a little uh, bit recessive. It's a great record, don't get me wrong, but it's not going to jump out on radio. And that is what, once Stevie and Lindsay enter into the Fleetwood Mac family, they find their place, they find their way to be more aggressive with their sound and hit it on radio.